Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Be Well Texas Recovery Support Services Echo. Thank you all for joining today. My name is Shreya Prasanna, and I will be facilitating today's session. Before we get started, please note that we are recording these sessions for later distribution. Please note that anything listed in the chat does not appear in the recording. These sessions are enabled for live closed captioning. If you'd like to view closed captioning, please navigate to the bottom of your Zoom window and select the show captions option. To help us with attendance, please enter your name, affiliation, and email into the chat. To access the chat, click on the speech bubble icon on the navigation bar at the bottom of your window. To all the BeWell Texas providers, please make sure that you identify yourselves during this session or if you're joining via phone, please email your phone number and name to bwelltx at yudhitska.edu. We appreciate your support in helping us fully capture this record. We love to see everyone's beautiful faces, so if you're comfortable, we encourage you all to join by video, especially for the discussion portion of today's Echo. We encourage everyone to speak, but ask that you stay muted unless you're speaking. You can also use the chat feature to raise questions and share comments. We want to hear from as many of you as possible, so please keep your comments brief to allow time for others to speak up. Please note that no predicted health information is allowed in either the chat or the discussion. That includes sharing names, exact dates on medical information in a way where someone could identify that person. During and after the session, our wonderful IT support, Keto, will send out a link to an evaluation of the session. All participants filling out the survey will be automatically entered into a raffle for a $30 Walmart gift card. Our didactic today is on navigating vicarious trauma with mindfulness and will be presented by Dr. Cynthia Phelps. We will start with introductions followed by didactics announcements and instead of a case today we will be having a, a mindfulness exercise so i'm really excited for today's session uh we encourage you all to share your perspectives today it's going to be a fun session and in the spirit of to all teach and all learn um we should request you to share your insights and experiences and with that we will do some introductions uh, richard Hi, good morning, everyone, or that afternoon now, and uh, we're so glad you're here. Richard Hamner, I'm with uh, Be Well Texas uh, Peer Support, Recovery Support uh, Program Manager and Hub Member. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Sean? Good afternoon, everybody. Sean Wright, a uh, member of the Hub team here and also Program Director for Recovery Support Services and a Peer Recovery Coach at Abilene Recovery Council. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us, Cynthia. Hello, I'm Cynthia Phelps. I'm your presenter today, and my company is Inner Ally, and I work with people who have experienced trauma. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Julie. Hi, everyone. Julie Parrish, Echo Program Manager here at Be Well Texas. Thanks so much for joining. Thank you. Andrea Hebler. Hello everyone, my name is Andrea Havler and I am a program coordinator with CSTAT. Welcome everybody. Thank you. And with that, we will move on to our didactics for today. Um, Cynthia, whenever you're ready, you can take it away. You're muted, Cynthia, if you could unmute yourself. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. And I uh, said before, I am with Inner Ally. That's my company. And it it's all about working with people on the inside, particularly those people who have experienced trauma. And I also work with quite a few people who have uh, struggled with addiction. All right. And I'm assuming we can just read these disclosures. All speakers and members of the planning committee have no relevant financial relationships with a commercial interest, including myself. And the views and opinions expressed by me are uh, just that. So let's 
get started. So today we're going to be talking about vicarious trauma. And so by the end of the session, I would hope that you would be able to define vicarious trauma for yourself and also be able to recognize it when it arises in yourself. Uh, we're going to be using the technique of mindfulness. And so I'm going to give a definition of mindfulness for you. And then we're going to learn a very simple set of mindfulness techniques to be able to help you be aware when vicarious trauma arises in you. And then also to be able to kind of work with it in your body. And so if some of that sounds a little strange, Hopefully it'll all get sorted out by the end here. So the definition of vicarious trauma uh, is that it, it is the emotional residue of the exposure to traumatic stories or experiences. Uh, it can also be when you are witnessing fear or pain or terror in others. And so the, the word vicarious just means that you are experiencing something through another person. And so when I say my friend is going on vacation in uh, Hawaii and I say, oh, I'm going to live vicariously through you. What that means is I'm not going to Hawaii, but I hope maybe they send pictures and tell me stories about it. And so vicarious trauma is the same uh, concept where if a person that is near you is experiencing trauma, a person that you're working with has or is even relating traumatic experiences from their past, these things have an impact on us. And so we actually can experience some trauma of our own just by being exposed to others' trauma. And so Sometimes this is called secondary traumatization or secondary stress disorder, uh, insidious trauma. Uh, I think it's called that sometimes because we don't realize it's happening. Uh, we have uh, understanding with certain traumatic events happen to ourselves that we can go like, oh yes, that's trauma. But when it's vicarious, sometimes we forget to kind of give it the gravity that it really deserves. And uh, vicarious trauma, particularly if it's not kind of dealt with, recognized, uh, can often lead to compassion fatigue, which is something I believe first kind of talked about in the field of nursing primarily, where when you get burnt out, you begin to not be able to relate to your patients as well. And so the same with working with clients, if you end up in a state of burnout, which is something that can happen if you have too much vicarious trauma that you're not really working with, then you can become less responsive to the people that you're working with. And so that doesn't serve anyone, it, it hurts you. Uh, and so that's why we're talking about this today. And so compassion fatigue can also be uh, known as empathy fatigue. And so why is that? Because oftentimes you can go through the kind of the role, you know, playing your role at work, but you are uh, not as empathetic to people's struggles. And so that is a definition of vicarious trauma. It's basically when you feel other people's trauma based on their stories or watching it directly and that you internalize it. And so it, re it, it can result in symptoms, anger, irritation, hypervigilance, where you're kind of worried about your own safety all the time. Uh, and I don't think I have to explain to this crowd what unhelpful coping strategies means. <laughs> uh, uh, difficulty sleeping, anxiety, diminished joy. And if you are noticing that a lot of these symptoms are very, very similar to burnout, then you are correct. Uh, vicarious trauma really does lead to burnout. And so many of these things are similar to burnout. 
um, intrusive thoughts of clients is a little more specific to just vicarious trauma symptoms that you might experience um, because you've been exposed to some of these stories. So one thing that's really important when we're working with clients is that we have an awareness of our own trauma. And so sometimes people think about trauma as, you know, like maybe getting in a car accident or being abused as a child, which are things that are very clearly trauma, right? But trauma is a huge range actually. And every human experiences some kind of trauma in their lives. Uh, it's just kind of where on the scale is it and what does it really like mean to you in your own life? And so if you can do an inventory of maybe some of the things that are, have been traumatic events for you, that can be very helpful. And like, how would you know how to do that inventory? Well, a lot of times um, these are the things where you might have some recurring thoughts around, or they kind of bother you over the long term. Um, but being aware of your own problems, of your own uh, uh, trauma can be an asset when you're working with a population uh, that's experienced trauma. And everybody who's in recovery has experienced trauma. And this kind of leads us into this idea of triggers. And I'm sure you've heard this in the popular, you know, literature, uh, you know, oh, you've triggered me. That means like I'm all of a sudden upset. But what it really means kind of from a psychology perspective is a trigger is in a oversized response to something. Uh, it, and so it is like an adverse emotional reaction. So you get either angry or sad, or you have some kind of response, but it's not really in line with, a, I don't like to say normal response, but like a normal level of uh, emotion in the situation. It's outsized, it's bigger. And so triggers usually are based on some of your own past trauma. Even if you haven't been able to kind of recognize it, what it does is it just kind of creates this vulnerability so that when others can express a related trauma, it's, it's like it hits a soft spot, if you will. And so matching trauma, one of the things that's important to understand is that when you're working with a client and if they are going through or have gone through the same kind of trauma that you have, it can really be a trigger for you. And so that might be something that you want to be aware of when you go and you're working with a, a client. Uh, because then you can give yourself a little advance notice that these things might come up for you. You might have a strong emotional reaction. So trauma as a trigger, but I really don't wanna leave out this idea uh, that trauma can also be your superpower. And so many of us that work in the recovery field have been in some way a participant in getting into recovery ourselves and have or, or have had other types of trauma in our lives. And so what this does for us is it allows us to really understand uh, in firsthand, what some other people are going through. And so trauma, we might uh, always associate that in our head with something bad, but as we're working ourselves to heal and to grow, really you can use some of those past experiences as your superpower to really help other people. Okay, so what does mindfulness have to do with any of this? Uh, well, mindfulness is a set of techniques that allow us to raise our level of awareness. And this is a definition that has been extracted from John Kabat-Zinn's uh, definition. And he is 
the person in the United States that basically first studied mindfulness and meditation with looking at its ability to lower stress. And so uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction is one of the programs that has been around now for, I think, over 20 years that people can get trained in uh, to help lower stress. Uh, but mindfulness itself is actually something that's very simple. It's just these three things, paying attention, like on purpose, doing this in the present moment. So you're not thinking about paying attention in the future. You're not worried about if you paid attention in the past, you're right here in the present moment. And then this third part is really the kicker. The, the way to do it is without judgment to just let what is be in the present moment. And so that's the hardest for me. And, uh, you know, for many people as we're first beginning to understand, uh, mindfulness. And so mindfulness is this idea of really being aware and awareness is really important when we're working with clients with trauma because we want to have some awareness of our own trauma we want to have some awareness when a person is beginning when they're telling us a story and we need to be aware in the present moment when we realize that this is a traumatic event that they're telling us about and so that's why i wanted to bring this tool of mindfulness to you today and so we're going to do just a tiny exercise here in mindfulness. And so um, the first thing I would like you to do is I would like you to look at my nose and direct your attention to my nose right now in the present moment. And so if you have some thoughts like, oh, she has a funny looking nose, that's a judgment. <laughs> <laughs> you can just let that float on past and bring your attention back to my nose. And now I would like you to direct your attention to your left hand. Just allowing your attention to rest on your left hand. Beginning to notice what your left hand feels like. Is there any pain? And now I want you to direct your attention to your lungs. It's a little bit trickier. We can't see them, right? But I want you to just see if you can rest your attention on your own lungs. perhaps even beginning to feel your breath. And often when we're doing a mindfulness exercise, our attention will wander off, but that's normal. Brains are always thinking. We just want to gather our attention back up and bring it right back to the place where we're purposely paying attention right now in the present moment. Okay. Well, you just did some mindfulness. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> So I wanted to give you uh, another uh, mindfulness technique. And this is a mindfulness technique that you can use when you're working with a, a client directly. And this technique uses your breath as an anchor for your attention. And it helps you to feel a little more grounded and calm while you might be listening to a pretty traumatic or activating story that someone is telling you. And so the idea here is that we can use our breath to bring our 
so we, we hold our attention both on our breath and on a client at the same time. But right now we're just going to, we're going to see if we can hold our attention on our own breath. So just allow yourself to breathe in and feel the breath out. Just this simple act of paying attention to your breath is something that you can do that's a calming technique that will allow you to better attend to your client, especially if you're starting to get activated. And one other technique that you can use, um, so much of, much of what I do is around compassion. Compassion is the response to suffering. And so if someone is relaying a uh, traumatic story or is directly going through trauma in front of you, you can also use this technique with some compassion. And so imagining that you're breathing in compassion and love and soothing for yourself. And as you breathe out, you can imagine your breath covering the client that you're working with or your friend that's telling you the story that happened to them, perhaps maybe as a blanket or as like some sparkly light, allowing yourself to visualize that however you really need. Doing just one more round with me now, breathing in some compassion for yourself feeling your lungs fill, perhaps even feeling it go all throughout your body as soothing. And now breathing out compassion for another. Okay, well, I think that is what I have for right now about vicarious trauma and mindfulness. And we're going to take a break right before we pop into the case study. Hi, yeah, we'll do some announcements first. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Phelps. But before that, I will would like to open up the floor for any questions or any experiences anybody would like to share. Pastor Deb. Oh. Thank you. Thank you for calling me. I was just thinking while we were doing the exercise and we were looking about the presenter's nose and our hand, that balance, going back and forth and exchanging um, that intention, my body to your body, and being able to do that on Zoom. I'm disabled and work from home. I do about 20 Zooms a week. And I feel very close to a lot of the people I work with and the clients I work with, the congregants that come to me in the private Zoom room. And I just wanted you to know, I think that's changing our brains. I think that um, getting people to trust us on a device, some people can't even speak because someone is threatening them and they have to, or intimidating and they have to text. And I think that we're finding many new ways to communicate. And I mean, some people send me messages on Google Translate in Spanish. And I don't speak Spanish, but I work hard to get those um, answers and get them to someone that does. I just wanted to say that technology, um, as scary as it is for old people, it is our friend. And I have some people coming out of prison uh, that have missed the technology boat. <laughs> and a 30 and 40 year, 50 year old person trying to catch on, it's intimidating. And I think if we could put that into the um, conversation for the professionals, when you're realizing that people come out and they're given a cheap phone or something, they don't know what the power they have. It's the power to relapse quickly. We've seen over here, <laughs> but it's also a powerful tool to advance. And I just wanted to share that. And thank you so much for letting me. Thank you thank so you much. Uh, I wanted to say that... Um, I noticed while doing this, am I echoing to y'all or just to me? I think you're fine. You're fine. 
Um, but I really appreciated that doing the mindful ex um, exercise, it really keeps focus that we're there for the peer, right? It takes it away from it being about us and how we feel. So I just really appreciated that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Kizzy, I saw your hand go up. Did you want to share something? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I really, really appreciate um, your presentation. It, 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 it gave me the verbiage and some understanding of, of what I've experienced within the last two years. However, it, it's not work related, but it's it's um it's personal um with a family member that um has severe MH and IDD. And um it talks about you spoke about um listening to stories, right? But I didn't get to listen to her story because she didn't have the ability to share her story, but I had the opportunity to experience experience her story over a two-year period. And what I can say is that it was so traumatizing to where it silenced my voice to the point where I couldn't talk about it. I couldn't even share the experience. Um, but the way that I was able to finally um, get some results in assisting her outside of getting guardianship when I joined the uh, Behavior Health Committee and got in front of the the the, the real leaders who was making the decision, then I got some help. But other than that, when I reached out to peers, when I reached out to leaders and, and higher positions, even with the best attempt, no one was really of assistance, even after I did everything that was suggested. And so I guess another takeaway would be is, um, being involved on different committees to come in and share the stories because that's the only way we got results. But yeah, I, I'll form secondary trauma, traumatization, secondary stress order, it almost took me out. I almost had to let my business go because it was that severe. And um, I appreciate this. I'm gonna go um, look up these different, these terms and um, and read about it a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, uh, you know, taking caretaking for someone, it can definitely cause uh, trauma in you in just so many ways, right? And when you do some research online, you're going to be able to find a variety of different techniques to be able to deal with vicarious trauma. Uh, and in burnout is actually very similar. And so you can search for that as well. And so much that uh, we need as humans is connection. And so, you know, I always encourage people to reach out to support groups and try to make sure you have a set of, you know, people around you who you can bounce these difficult experiences off. And uh, I think, uh, you know, in the recovery world, it would be really fabulous if we could have teams where, or even peer, like professional peer support, where we're talking about some of the difficulties we're experiencing because we're working in this field, which is, which is challenging. And so be, and, and, you know, it's also, we have to pay attention to patients' privacy and, you know, HIPAA laws and things like that. Those are incredibly important, but we also have to, we, ha we have to speak it out of our body. And so uh, in the case study, we're going to be doing a little activity that will help with that. Um, but there's nothing like talking to other people. Thank you so much. Um, Tiffany. Thank you. Really quickly. Um, that was so awesome. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, what I identified is that um, my career in social service and human service and actually my substance use disorder go hand in hand. You know, I realized that once um, I got into recovery and I started actually working in recovery. And I so appreciate you um, sharing this because when I first got into recovery, um, mindfulness in the psychiatric hospital was one of the first things that helped me sustain recovery. And so even now, years later, um, 
And I admit often that I go back and forth between compassion fatigue. And so what I'm learning, and I love the compassion to me, the compassion to them while working uh, with peers. Um, and so even like in my groups, I teach them mindfulness so that, you know, they can pull on the professionals a little less, you know, or at least have this tool so that as they're going on, um, they have something that really works. So thank you. This is like my favorite subject right now because I'm really pulling on it for myself personally and even in a community. So thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that, Tiffany. You know, um, I am a certified teacher of something called mindful self-compassion and uh, self-compassion, this idea of being kind uh, and supportive of myself, that is what uh, secured my recovery 10 years ago. And so I love this stuff and I love teaching it. Um, and I have a resource, uh, you know, you said you're teaching to some of your um, uh, peers. Uh, this book, Trauma Sensitive Mindfulness, if you're into mindfulness stuff, this uh, this uh, David Trelevin did his dissertation on how to do mindfulness for people. Uh, with, oh, good, Tiffany. <laughs> I'll put it on the I'll put it in the chat, too. Uh, but he did his dissertation on how to work with people who have had trauma, because some of the mindfulness techniques that you might use with regular people, <laughs> if you will, um, can re-traumatize. It can dissociate. There are, there are, you know, we hear, oh, meditation is, you know, the best thing in the whole world. But in fact, there are people who negatively respond to it. And it's almost always people with trauma. And so that's what this book is about. And so I can, um, I can put this in the chat too for us. Thank and you. I'm, so I'm going to, I'm going to put my info in the chat. You know, one of the things that I'm offering th all through the month of November, I do free practice sessions, which involves talking about a topic and then doing like a 10 minute mindfulness activity uh, and then talking about it. And so you're more than welcome. It's free and it's uh, the Eventbrite link there if you're interested. Thank you so much. We we had a question here, uh, Dr. Phelps, which, uh, in the chat. Um, what is the difference between burnout and vicarious trauma? You can burn out without having vicarious trauma. And so imagine if you're working like a corporate job, um, you're not seeing trauma, you, you know, you're not experienced, you're not being traumatized by the environment, but you just have an excessive workload. Uh, or perhaps the environment is, uh, you know, not very emotionally healthy for you, you know, and, uh, and so the burdens that are on you are too many and you don't have recovery time, you know, so maybe like you're pushing really hard for a big project and it takes months and you haven't had, you know, a day off. So there's, there's ways that we can overtax ourselves without experiencing trauma. But other than that, they're very similar. Thank you so much. And That's yes. That's right, Lindsay. Lindsay said the opposite is also true. You can experience vicarious trauma without burnout. And that's a very good point because uh, there are a lot of us that can work with vicarious trauma without having negative side effects. And um, these people often are first responders <laughs> or they're in other careers like nursing or and so forth. And so um, the mindfulness piece in this is really all about self-assessing. And so uh, I think I was in my 40s before I really realized that emotions live in the body. <laughs> uh, and so the body is like our uh, barometer for how well we're doing. You know, if we're feeling stress or if we're feeling pain, uh, our bodies are what tells us how to uh, gauge how well we're doing. And so that's why mindfulness is such an important practice for anybody who experiences uh, trauma or, or vicarious trauma. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Fels, and thank you all uh, for these uh, wonderful questions and comments. Please keep them coming. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, we will quickly do some announcements from the BVAL program. Thank you, Kira, for sharing those. The Center for Substance Use Training and Telementoring provides high quality education in best practices for responding to substance use. CSTAT can help enhance professional knowledge and self-efficacy to screen, treat, and make referrals to people with substance use disorders. To learn more, please visit us at cstat.yutiska.edu. Next slide. Please join us for our next Texas session. This will be on Wednesday, November 15th at 12 noon. You can find out more at texas.org uh, slash sessions. Next slide. Um, we'll save the date. Our next Texas uh, symposium is happening on February 29th and March 1st. Uh, please visit the website to for registration and uh, other information. Next slide. Our next recovery support services echo will be on Wednesday, November 22nd. We have a wonderful session lined up, so please do join us. And with that, we will move on to our uh, case study. Uh, Dr. Fels, I will hand it back over to you to lead us. All righty then. Let me just share a slide here. Just to get us started. We are going to work with a case study that you've already had, which is very strange, right? Usually you get exposed to a new one, but all of you have been in a situation where someone was telling a story or perhaps even going through trauma in front of you. And it doesn't have to necessarily be professional. If you can think of an instance uh, where this has happened to you professionally, that would be great. Um, if not, you know, maybe it is uh, like a dear friend who was crying about something that happened to them or uh, or like the example from um, the earlier about taking care of somebody who is uh, end of life or, or very ill. And so what I want you to do is poke around in your past and see if you can come up with a case study for yourself. And here are the criteria. This is just a practice today. And so we want to make sure that you stay safe in this practice. And so on a scale of one to 10, where a one is when you were listening to this person, you didn't really feel hardly any difficult emotions where a 10 was like you were super triggered you or, um, uh, and that you were, uh, wanting to escape, you know, maybe you even had, you know, your heart rate went up or you flushed, that would be a 10. So I don't want you to pick a 10 <laughs> and I don't want you to pick a one. I want you to choose a three. Which, is, which means you could feel the pain that this person was going through. Uh, and maybe even you could relate it to your personal pain, but it wasn't uh, emotionally dysregulating you. So you were still able to stay calm and to listen and to be helpful. So I'm going to give you just a moment to think about that. And we're going to go into a activity here. And so this is a, a mindfulness activity. And so when you do this, you can either close your eyes if you if that helps you to focus, or you can always kind of cast them downward uh, as a way to help you focus, whatever feels right for you. And uh, unlike, you know, meditation in a sangha or a uh, temple or something, you don't have to sit in any particular way. I want you to just be comfortable uh, where you are. And 
In this experience, we're going to be tapping in to some trauma uh, that might be activating for you, right? And so I like to use this example of like a, a box where the trauma, your own trauma is on the inside of it. And we can kind of open and close. Uh, and maybe in this case study, the other person's trauma is in here as well. And so this is a metaphor for like here, you're opening, you're being more empathetic. You're letting more of the other person's pain in. You're feeling more of your own pain in your own body. That's opening. Opening is like you're listening. You're actively engaging with the other person. Closing is like you're kind of sitting back. You're you're kind of taking a breath. Maybe you're distracting yourself just a little bit. Uh, it is... Um, a way for you to help emotionally regulate yourself. And so there is no good or bad to opening and closing. The whole idea is that you have kind of control over how much of this you want to feel in your body. And I can't tell you what the right uh, amount is because I'm not inside of your body. And so you can use your own experience as a way to kind of gauge yourself through this exercise. And so just uh, this is something that David Trelevin uh, teaches is uh, giving people several options while you do a mindfulness activity helps people who have experienced trauma to be able to participate. And so if any time in this activity, you feel like it's becoming too much for you, please just open your eyes, feel free to mute me, feel free to get up and get a, a glass of water. <laughs> <laughs> this activity is for you. And so uh, if it's not working for you, it, it is 100% okay to bail out of it. So uh, are there any questions before we get started? All right, well, let's do it. So if you would like, you can close your eyes or cast them downward. And we're going to begin to bring our attention away from the workday, away from the tasks we have to do, and begin to bring our attention inside of ourselves. Perhaps taking a deep breath in. And as you release, allowing your shoulders just to drop a bit. I want you to begin to notice that even though we're each in our own process here, that we are not alone, we are in fact supported by everyone else who is here wanting to learn and grow. Now beginning to use your attention just like we directed around before. And I want you to place it somewhere in your body, perhaps in your lungs or your nose following your breath, or maybe it's back in your hand or a toe allowing yourself just to poke around and see where your attention wants to rest. And if your mind is active with thoughts, that's okay. That's what the mind does. Just let it do its thing and bring your attention back to the sound of my words. We're going to begin to put ourselves in that situation where we had that difficult case, a difficult peer experience, someone was explaining their trauma or experiencing trauma, remembering that you can take this 
and make it as far away as you need or as close in, allowing yourself to open and close to this experience as you need. Beginning to put yourself in the situation that you've chosen. Beginning to hear the difficult stories. And as this is happening, I want you to pay attention to your body. I want you to see if you can notice, even just thinking about this past experience, if it's showing up in your body anywhere, perhaps as a tension or a pain. or maybe just an ache, allowing yourself to visualize this in your body. Perhaps it looks like a patch of color or an area that takes up a space like a ball or some other shape. This is the representation of the trauma, maybe the other person's trauma combined with yours, or maybe just theirs. And if it feels weird to try to find this in your body, that's okay. You are allowed to just visualize it and place it there for today, just for a moment as we practice feeling into the spot in your body where it is sitting. We're going to just soothe it a moment, sending it some soothing energy. And if you visualized it perhaps as a patch of color, maybe the edges are just beginning to fade soothing this energy in your body. And we're going to just see if we can soften it a little, maybe taking off the hard edges, softening. And if you're willing or able, sometimes taking a hand and placing it over that part of our body where this trauma is residing can feel comforting. Perhaps the pressure from your hand or maybe there's warmth from your hand radiating in this area of your body, softening and soothing that trauma. And now beginning to release your visualization, allowing that story from that other person who uh, ended up in your body, we're just going to see if we can allow it to be without any need to change it or fix it. We're just gonna put down the doing and we're gonna just allow. Even if it's just for a moment. And now coming back into your body, and if any of that visualization feels like it's still in your body, 
allowing it to just slide down out of your body. Perhaps it's going with the out breath. Beginning to bring your attention back into the room in which you're seated. Beginning to expand your attention to include all of us here coming across together from distant places, supporting each other to better serve others, sitting for just a moment in this space, being supported by our peers. And taking one last deep breath in. And as you release it, releasing this activity and allowing yourself to come back into the room, perhaps wiggling your fingers and toes and allowing yourself to open your eyes whenever you'd like. Welcome back, everyone. Strange case study, huh? <laughs> so there's many purposes to this activity. One is to really have a tangible idea of how trauma gets lodged in our bodies and can stay there. It also gives us a little bit of a technique, a softening and soothing technique. And it also gives us the opportunity to kind of flush it out of our bodies as well. And so uh, in these experiences, uh, this is a practice. We just did it once, but these are the types of practices. If you do them multiple times, you can protect yourself from trauma getting lodged in your own body. And so it's not like one instance of this practice is going to magically cure everything, but it is the process of engaging in mindful practices like this that will allow you to begin to move the vicarious trauma out of your body, move your own trauma out of your body. <laughs> Uh, and I uh, don't know how much time we have, but I always like to hear about people's experiences of the practice. And this is uh, all emotions are welcome and uh, there is no wrong experience. Thank you so much. This was a very interesting experience for me as well. So, uh, but I will open up the floor for people to share if uh how they felt during uh, the case study today and uh, if they have uh, used this before with any of the R when they deal with clients. Hi, I'd like to share my experience. I'm Regina. Um, um, you know, yesterday, um, I was making some calls um, to some participants to see, you know, uh, to follow up, and um, and um, and I and I called one uh, participant, and I, I got her friend, and uh, he explained to me once she left the program that she was in, she returned to use, and um, you know, and uh, and she, you know, she passed away two days after leaving the program and uh, and so he, he started uh, processing with me and uh, telling me you know um, how he took her you know that day and, and took her to fix herself up and get her hair done nails done and everything because she was going to visit with her son and he was telling me how good and how well she did in that program and um, she wanted to start the MAP program. And he had many of years of her going back and forth, back and forth. And he just didn't uh, pursue her. So he was feeling guilty 
because he didn't take her to start that. And he felt like if he would have taken her to get started, she wouldn't have returned to use, you know. Um, and he was just going on and on, you know, and uh and and uh the just two years ago I lost my son. And um and it was the um day after my birthday and they had a celebration for my birthday. So the entire family was there. And the next day he was murdered, you know, and uh and he um and and I wanted him to stay with me that night so we can talk. But it was so much going on and I put it off to the next day. So sometime, although I know that I'm not the one who did it, but initially, you know, I was thinking if I would have just let him stay that night, you know, and things. And that's what the uh, the gentleman that was sharing with me brought, you know, that's what this meditation brought in. And so I allowed him to just process you know, uh, yesterday on the phone. And then, um, I, you know, and I, and I share with him, you know, that it, it wasn't his fault. He did all that he could, you know, and reassured him and, and, and everything, you know, but, um, so this mindfulness is where I, I went there because it just happened yesterday, you know, so thank you. I really appreciate it because, um, Although I'm still feeling it some, but it's good to have the awareness and and how I'm not feeling as heavy, you know, and I, and and just me talking about it right now, you know, the emotions are there, but I feel really good about it. And I'm glad that I was there to uh, allow the, the young man to talk. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for sharing, Regina, you know, and as you were telling those stories, I was breathing in compassion because I can feel a deep empathy for you in what you went through and what you're still going through. And uh, these practices, you know, we can do live. And I'm so glad you were here to, to play along with that case study and to have those skills of just finding that pain in our body that trauma in our body and just loving on it and soothing it and softening it this is gonna this is gonna help you so much thank you for that share thank you so much and thank you for sharing regina um richard hi guys thank you so much cynthia and regina i really do feel for for your loss there and just the experience you had. I wanted to ask real quick, I know I'm gonna probably provide some closing thoughts in a minute, but um, can, if, if I'm working with an individual and they're sharing that story and you touched on this in your, in your presentation, the didactic, what can I do at the moment uh, to kind of help lessen that trauma that I may be, that vicarious trauma, the trauma I may be uh, feeling at that time? Uh, it, I clearly can't go through an, a mindfulness exercise like we just did. But uh, if you could touch on that again, especially with the recovery support, that's so important to be able to do that. Absolutely. And so, you know, the, the technique that we did with breathing in compassion for ourselves and then breathing out compassion for the other, I find that to be one of the most effective because it's something that you can do with your eyes open and you can split your attention between the person who you are serving and yourself. And, you know, some people might listen to that and say like, well, I'm here, I'm here to serve other people. That sounds selfish, taking some attention away from them, right? But actually it's not because we need you not just here today, but we need you here tomorrow and next week and next month. <laughs> and so it's, also really important for us to regulate our own nervous system while the other person is experiencing the trauma or retelling the trauma. And so an eyes open mindfulness uh, uh, technique like that, where you're just following your breath. And as you're breathing out, you're, you can imagine you're just blanketing the other person with love, compassion, whatever word you want to use, you know, empathy. Uh, and then when you're breathing in for yourself, breathe in compassion. Compassion is the response to suffering and suffering is what's happening in that exchange, even though it's not 
maybe direct, right? It, it is vicarious. And so compassion, just feeling it as you breathe it in your lungs and you know, sometimes people like to say, oh, like I'm breathing it up from the earth or, you know, I like when we're in a situation like that, like this, we can breathe it from the collective, you know, cause we are all here because we are compassion workers. We are here to help people with their suffering, right? And so even thinking about breathing in from your community, your professional community, to empower yourself in that moment, uh, and then breathing out that compassion for the other. I think that's probably the thing that I would recommend uh, the highest, to kind of regulate your own nervous system. And it you don't have to have 100% of your attention on it. You can keep a uh, uh, Quite a bit of your attention on the other person in the process. Does Absolutely. that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, this has been uh, a wonderful session. Thank you again. Um, Richard, if you could please, uh, I know we're on time. If you could just give us a quick summary of uh, today's session. Thank I will. You. I had made some notes. Thanks, everyone, uh, for your participation with this. And thank you, uh, Dr. Phelps. I, I, just real quick, uh, just the whole idea in the presentation about just recognizing vicarious trauma uh, and just how in secondary trauma that we don't realize at the time that we have, but that, that those actually knowing, being able to recognize your body and your system uh, and so that uh, you can avoid some of the compassion fatigue and some of the, you know, the burnout and those other issues. Uh, uh, and I think that uh, just understanding too that, that, that if it, you're actually feeling others' trauma and you're internalizing it, and you may not recognize that. Uh, so I had so many notes, I can't even, it's just mumble jumble and I don't have time to get through it all. It was a lot. Uh, I want to thank you for that. But uh, the, the exercise, the breathing, focus on your breath, uh, I would just say, you know, that those are the high points for me. Thank you so much, Richard. And thank you again, uh... Uh, Cynthia for this wonderful presentation and thank you all for joining today and participating uh, in the case study um, as a reminder to continue to earn the continuing education credits please complete the survey uh, the link of which is in the chat our next session will be on Wednesday November 22nd have a wonderful rest of your day thank you